Hey everyone, how's it going? Now, a while back, I planned to do a review of The Dark Tower, which I eventually did after dealing with a crap ton of technical issues and having to use a uh, not so great uh, software redo the video. And I wasn't even able to get the video segments to show either, but luckily I was able to uh, get those back and well, behold, restore edition. The man in black fled across the desert, and the gunslinger followed. These words are usually the first thing people think of when asked about the Dark Tower, starting with the gunslinger in 1982 and ending with the wind through the keyhole in 2012. The Dark Tower is author Stephen King's magnum opus, linked to almost all of his previous works, and- Yeah, you already said that in the last video. Shut up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you look like Heisenberg from Resident Evil 8? Anyway. The books became so popular that Marvel would eventually go to King and collab on the Dark Tower comic series in the form of a prequel series. And though it would be based on King's notes and stories, the majority of it would be written by Robin Firth, who actually worked as King's research assistant, and Peter David. Starting with, of course, today's book published in 2017 with Jay Lee on art and mostly expanding story elements from the fourth book in the series, Wizard in Glass. The comic series had uh, kind of a mixed reception. Some people really liked it, thinking that it was a nice addition to the series, while other fans felt like, you know, it missed the point entirely. What do I think? Warning spoilers. We open in the dimension of Midworld, in the city called Gilead, and follow Roland, a 14-year-old boy and his friends training to be gunslingers, who though looking like cowboys are more actually viewed as the same vein as medieval knights. Roland's father is actually the current leader of the gunslingers, and who of course Roland strives to be like. They're being trained by a man named Court, whose training involves taking a hawk and training them to hunt for them, all while Court will try to stop them from getting their prey, which succeeds. A defeated Roland returns home to find that his mother has been having an affair with with the town's wizard named Martin Broadcloak, who is also Roland's father's advisor. Martin uses this to goad Roland into challenging court, which will end with either him becoming a gunslinger or being banished. Roland does succeed in defeating his mentor and becoming a gunslinger, though at the cost of losing his pet hawk, David, in the fight. And after revealing to Martin that he is aware that he intended to have him banished and burying his fallen hawk, he goes to a whorehouse to lose his virginity. And just a reminder, Roiland is only 14 years old. Out of all the tropes that had to show up from King's work, it had to be that one all kinds of creepy. Roland's father shows up and berates him, and then tells him that Martin in fact plans to kill him, since he seems to know who Roland is destined to be in the future. To protect his son, Roland's father plans to send him and his friends away in the city of Hambury. Meanwhile, men come and try to arrest Martin, who by this point is revealed to be the Man in Black, aka one of the main villains of the series, also stand, and he proceeds to turn them into pugs. No, really. He does that, but before he informs his master of his failings, though has already set up a plan B to take out Roland by hiring bandits. That master is simply known as the Crimson King. And no, I'm not doing a JoJo reference, okay? Cause f While on their way, Roland meets a young girl named Susan, who he immediately becomes smitten with. But once he makes it to town, he then finds out that Susan has actually been tasked to be the mayor's mistress. After learning the truth about his mother and Martin, Roland has a deep hatred for those who commit adultery, and his feelings towards Susan gets complicated. It definitely doesn't help that when the Banshop, who call themselves the Big Coffin Hunters, that the Man in Black hired to kill Roland, shows up and it gets pretty intense on a crazy Lovecraftian level. This is a very interesting comic. This was a pretty big challenge for Robin Firth and Peter David since they have to take flashbacks and stories that were talked about in the books and expand them and make them still feel like they're part of Stephen King's work. And ask anyone who's read The Dark Tower will tell you that anyone who attempts to write in the same style that King writes those books, yeah, that's a gauntlet, man. That is a gauntlet. And I will say, in most parts, I think they did a decent job. But 
but you can tell in some scenes when it's King and when it's Firth and David. In most parts of the story, it's not that noticeable. Also, if you're intending for this to be a good jumping on point for people who are interested in the Dark Tower series, this isn't. Since this is a prequel, the book does expect you to know at least most of the core elements of the Dark Tower series. It will provide some explanation, like who the Man in Black is and the Crimson King, but most of the time you're kind of on your own on trying to figure out how this world works, which definitely hurts the comic. As for the characters, of course we're going to start with Roland. For those who read the books, you'll definitely see elements of who Nolan is going to be in the future, with his more serious and honorable nature. But since he's also, you know, 14 years old in this comic, we also see him being more emotional, which definitely gets him into some serious trouble, like how the Man in Black was able to manipulate him into, you know, taking the challenge, which risked him into becoming banished, and the big coffin hunters showing up in Hambury, and yes, which, not gonna lie, could get kind of annoying. I will say when it comes to his relationship with Susan, it's really interesting because, as mentioned before, he really does have an issue when it comes to adultery. Though he knows that Susan is doing this because of an issue of duty, he still has problems with it, and so seeing him trying to move past it is very interesting. Next, we have Roland's companions in the comic, Alan and Cuthbert, or Bert as some people will call him, who are pretty great characters. Elaine is kind, but also a pretty awkward gunslinger. He's a bit shy, and because of this, a lot of people believe he's kind of stupid, but in reality, he's a pretty damn good gunslinger, especially because he has the shining, though in this world, it's called the touch. Yes, he has the touch. He has the power. Cuthbert at first seems pretty normal, but he's actually a, a bit off. Best and only example, he talks to a crow skull that he named Lookout. He's kind of seen as the jokester to Roland Straight Man, which is a pretty funny dynamic, but he's also pretty loyal to Roland and is a great marksman. Unfortunately, because this is a prequel and Roland is known as the last gunslinger, the main books mean that the two will not have a happy ending. Next, we got Susan, Roland's love, who, as mentioned in the story, is in a pretty stressful situation. Her father's dead, pressured into being the mistress of the mayor despite the fact that she's 16 years old. Again, King, what the hell? And his pressure to do it because of her greedy aunt. And though finding love in Roland gets complicated as, again, he has issues with adultery. And despite the fact that the big coffin hunters aren't after her, she winds up having to deal with that crap at some point. Seriously, this girl will go through trials and tribulations that I haven't even talked about. And you desperately want want her to get through this. But again, because of the prequel, that yeah, when it comes to Roland's love life, it is not easy for him. Now as a character, Susan is pretty stoic in some parts to the point where it does kind of borderline on being a bit dull, but when her character does shine, it shines pretty well and gives this sense that she is a very virtuous woman despite the fact that she has to be in this uncomfortable situation. Moving on, we go to the villains of the story, starting with the Man in Black, who they don't even try to hide the fact that he's evil. I mean, just look at him! Besides his infamous choice in clothing, he's tormented innocent people, plots to bring the end of existence with his master, but most importantly, he kicks dogs. You are definitely rooting for Roland to take this man down. Whenever he talks to someone, you always feel just uneasiness, and it gives a sense that no one is safe around him. Like, not even his allies. Which is great for a villain. There's only been one exception to that, but I'll get into that in a moment. He is seen as one of the greatest villains that King has written, and I will say that Firth and David did not disappoint when it came to that. Now, let's get into the exception. The Crimson King, the Man in Black's master, and despite having a limited appearance in this comic, he makes one hell of a first impression. It is chilling. Whenever he speaks, he makes it clear that the Man in Black is the servant while he is the master. Even when he's not around, you constantly feel his presence, not unlike Sauron from Lord of the Rings. If I had any complaints when it comes to this character, I would say it is the design. Not saying it's bad or anything, it's definitely creepy, but in most versions, you never get a full look of what he actually looks like, his body mostly covered in a red cloak, not unlike one of the inspirations, the King in Yellow from Lovecraft. 
but besides that, the artist did at least get the spider motif down, which is referenced several times in the series, and is a bit important when it comes to his character. Finally, we got the hired guns, the Big Coffin Hunters. As you can see, the Hunters are in a group of three, womanizing in vain Clay Reynolds, bloodthirsty but dimwit Roy DePape, and their leader, the devious and spiteful Eldred Jonas. Their dynamic as a team is pretty standard. They're all very skilled killers, but Jonas, of course, is the most dangerous since he is the leader. He trained as a gunslinger, but unlike Roland, failed his test and was cast out, which means that he has both a personal grudge against gunslingers and won't underestimate the trio just because they're teens. Of course, there are many, many more characters I could get into, like the mayor, Susan's aunt, and the creepy witch, Rhea of the Coos. But of course, I do have a limited time, and some of these characters are heavily tied into some major spoilers. I will say, though, that they are written pretty well, and especially Rhea, that was done by Jay Lee and Richard S. Nov. With Lee's style, though being very unique and stunning in some cases, can only really work in certain kinds of stories. One example of that not working is in the New 52 Superman Batman series, where it really clashed with the tone. Luckily for this story, with its mystical and horror elements, fits pretty perfectly, though he did fumble with some of the designs, like the Crimson King as mentioned, and Cuthbert, who though in the book is described with blonde on here, it's black in this book. Iznov does a great job with the color, combining the warm colors that are associated with the Old West to the cold and dark elements of horror stories. The Dark Tower comic is a bit clunky, but on a whole, I enjoyed myself. Again, I do not recommend using this as a jumping on point to the series, and I do believe that this will upset a few fans, but on a whole, it's not a bad read, it's pretty harmless, and yeah, I still would say give it a look. Thanks for watching. Like, share, and subscribe. And next time, as the Dark Tower does incorporate dealing with multiple worlds and unnatural horrors, the next book will be doing the same. No, I'm kidding. There's, there's so much that I have to cover before I even consider this. Uh, but the next one does actually have something connected to the Dark Tower series. There you go. That is what I intended the uh, Dark Tower review to go. Well, as much as I could. And yeah, it did set me back a little bit because I was working on the Brave and the Bold review and I just finished doing the scripts for the Black Sad comics. So they might be a little late than planned, but eh, I really don't care for uh, leaving loose ends. Anyway, I'll repeat what I said, uh, well, months ago. Thanks for watching, like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you later.